Hey everyone, my name is Fernando Cordova, and I'm joined by James Close and Brad Bourgeois. And thank you for joining us here at Theology on Tap here in Monroe. Uh, before we get started, uh, we usually like to kick things off with the Lord's Prayer. And for this particular presentation, we want to dedicate the Lord's Prayer to, for the intentions of all the Hurricane Ida victims here in Louisiana and elsewhere, and we also want to pray for those who have been uh, affected by COVID and who are currently suffering with uh, COVID infection as well. And so if everyone will join me in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, it's been a while since we've, uh, you know, posted on our Theology on Tap channel, but we want to thank you for uh, <laughs> tuning in once again to watch us. Uh, today we're going to talk about apologetics, you know, kind of like an intro to apologetics, as particularly as it relates to Catholicism, you know, Christianity in general. And uh, I'm so excited to have you, Brad, here with us. Thank uh, you, brother. Uh, why, before we get started, just you know, tell the audience a little bit about you, maybe a little bit about the faith journey, maybe what you do, and, and uh, yeah. That's funny, Fernando, because uh, I had the chance to kind of say that today, and it, it kind of overwhelmed me. It made, me, it made myself tired mm. to recount kind of the, the journey I, had, I, I have kind of come through. <laughs> and it was just in like six words. What did I say? I said I was, I was Catholic. I went from Catholic to Methodist to Evangelical, non-denominational, to Presbyterian, to back to Catholic. And that's, uh, and with a few stops on the way. So, um, you know, I'm sort of a spiritual mutt uh, mm -hmm. who has come full circle by God's grace um, into um, the Catholic Church. And, you know, if we're going to talk about apologetics today, that was a whole lot of what got me um, back into the church. And, um, and so it's something I love to do because I I'd, I'd challenged myself um, in coming back to the Catholic Church um, that I, I kind of was, I was not just ignorant of my Catholic faith, I became hardened against the Catholic Church, or at least what I thought was the Catholic Church. Uh, and so I had a lot to overcome, and reading a lot of apologists, uh, the, the works, their works of apologetics uh, helped a lot, um, and setting myself some kind of challenge goals um, is another thing that, that, that kind of helped me to kind of maybe hone and sharpen and be able to give that ready defense that we're called to give mm -hmm. in, in sacred scripture that ready defense mm -hmm. for the hope that we have in us. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I, I brought my wife, who was not raised Catholic. Uh, she was largely raised non-denominational and Southern Baptist. Um, and, you know, we brought three and three-quarters children in tow when we were confirmed uh, because she was, my <coughs> wife was pregnant with our fourth little blessing at the time, and we've since added another one to that number. So I'm married to the lovely Adrian formerly Fries Bourgeois, and mm -hmm. we have five children. Our oldest is 18, mm -hmm. and our youngest is eight, so mm -hmm. uh, that's a little bit about me. That's, I, and I'm glad you mentioned, you know, the, have, being ready to bring a defense or to give reason for the hope that lies within us, and that's, it's interesting, whenever we talk about apologetics, it's always important to kind of define terms. Um, and define what you're actually talking about with someone else so that you're not talking past each other. And apologetics comes from the Greek word apologia. And that Greek word is actually used in huh, Pope Peter's, 1 Peter 3.15, when Peter writes, always be prepared to give a defense or reason for the hope that lies within you and be gentle and reverent when you do it. And so apologia is used for to say a defense or to give a defense. So that's kind of what we're talking about today. Uh, when, when you're engaging in apologetics, you're engaging in a tool for evangelization. Like it's, you're not just defending the faith, you're explaining why you believe what you believe to somebody else who may not be knowledgeable about Catholicism or Christianity in general. 
Um, in fact, we read at the beginning of Acts where St. Paul was arguing with the Jews in the temple, uh, trying to convince them of Christianity, you know, as opposed to the Orthodox Judaism that's still present today. Uh, but when, what I tell people is, it, just to kind of set the tone, <clears throat> is what I tell people is if you're going to get into apologetics, you have to remember that it's primarily you have to listen to what someone else has to say about Catholicism or Christianity. You want to answer, sometimes you have to ask questions in order to really come down to what they believe. And that way you understand where they're coming from and you understand their perspective. So if you ask questions, then they're going to think about the response. And then they're going to give you a response, hopefully. And that way, okay, now you have a foundation to, to build upon. So they, you ask questions, you get a response, and then maybe, you know, if, they're, if it's an argument, contrary to popular belief, arguments are good. A good argument is a good thing. A lot of people don't know how to argue, but if they argue with you, well, then listen to them to understand, and then challenge, you know, what they tell you. So, and at the end, um, if you can find some common ground with them, hey, that's great. You're not going to change someone's mind overnight. You know, it's going to take, it's going to take some time for them to be exposed to those new ideas. Because you planted a seed and you kind of threw a little smoke <clears throat> in right. something, maybe stop the gear turning to kind of pause it or slow it down a little bit to maybe mm -hmm. check and see what direction it wants to turn or something. You, you know, exactly right. You sow that seed, and and the reason I, I learned this because I, when I was younger, when I was you know. I was still, I always stayed Catholic, you know, I, I grew up Catholic, but I, I stayed Catholic because, you know, I, of course, I did my research kind of like you, and I, I compared what the different beliefs were for each denomination, Christian, Christian denomination, but when I found myself, whenever someone would, uh, would pepper me with, with questions or objections to what Catholics believe, you know, it's like, why do Catholics worship Mary, right, or why do y'all baptize babies, right? Um, the the why do y'all pray to dead people? You know, it, it, the normal, you know, All the common things. ones. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of would find myself a little overwhelmed. Like I kind of <clears throat> drew a blank a little bit, and I was kind of like, okay, I don't I don't know what to say, you know. So I, I was kind of overwhelmed, and I learned that asking questions takes you out of the hot seat and puts you in the driver's seat, right? You and not drive just, the conversation. Not just that. Um, it, I think we see Jesus' own way. It, 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 it emulates and imitates the Lord more effectively. Jesus mm -hmm. met people where they were. Jesus himself asked questions. Uh, and he had the luxury of knowing everything about everyone he came into contact with. But he, um, you know, it, he... He was probative, and he was mm. was probing, and just sought to know know the person, and sought to kind of bring. He did he did challenge him. He he mm. saw him constantly doing that in the Gospels. Mm -hmm. um, but it just you know we all feel better when we we are known and and at least respected. I don't I don't want to say that you know somebody off the street you'll say like loved you'll you, that you love them on but you should we should love our, love our neighbors. But to someone to feel loved, you know, to kind of lay that foundation, I like to call it making a deposit. Mm. You know, it's, it's yeah. you show someone respect <clears throat> and, um, and try to, you know, on social media, I'm known, I'm kind of notorious for kind of <laughs> like setting off Molotov cocktails or something. I'll put out something that's pretty <laughs> provocative. But then I, and, and I have friends from all walks of life. I, I, I went, went through a, a fairly, I have a, a pretty varied past, I guess, and, and friends from all persuasions and political leanings and religious leanings and atheism leanings and agnostic leanings and so mm. it ends up it often can be kindling for a just explosion and uh <clears throat> i um i try to very respectfully deal with every with everybody and i kind of won't engage if someone is going to immediately mm. be you know really disrespectful right out of the gate mm. or i'll challenge them and just you know i pray for them inwardly mm. but i just i like to make a deposit and to to be kind first and foremost, and to show interest. So that when you're t saying ask questions, people like to be asked questions. People like to be <clears throat> sought after and 
and loved and respected. So the at the question firing um, approach, maybe not firing, all the scatter shot approach, but, right, sort of. right. But it at least yeah. you know, sort of, you know, you ask them their background, and you, mm. you know, I, I like like the woman at the well is probably the biggest in John chapter mm. four. Yeah, um, is probably one of my favorite. Um, um, times of the Lord operating with humanity and, and engaging mm-hmm. with humanity. You know, he, you know, he challenged a woman on her whole lifestyle. Yeah. And um, but only could do that if she knew that she was loved by him. Mm-hmm. So I think yeah. that that's important. And, and just you know, to, well, go ahead. Yeah. Just a just a kind of further touch on that. There's a lot of value in sort of flipping the script and asking questions. You know, it's I hate to call it a tactic, it kind of is, but what it is, you know, it's called the Socratic method in you know, many contexts. Brad's, of course, familiar with this as well, uh, just from law school. And there's no greater tool that humans have ever really come up with for extracting truth than just simply questioning people. Because in an argument situation, it's, it's so easy to just stand there and throw bombs at people, but it's another thing entirely when you're put on the spot And suddenly you're having to articulate a coherent reason, a coherent, you know, thought process behind what you're saying. It puts people, it kind of, you know, like I said, it flips the script. It makes people actually have to come up with something of substance to think about why they think about why they're saying the things Mm -hmm. that they're saying. And so, you know, again, I don't want to really call it a tactic, but it's a tool. It's a tool for you know, developing the argument and for extracting the truth. I mean, ultimately, what we're all in pursuit of is the truth. And Mm -hmm. there's no greater tool for in the pursuit of truth than questions. Mm -hmm. And and choose, you know, talking about our Lord, um, not everyone's going to be polite with you. Not everyone's going to be nice or um, charitable, uh, gentle and reverent. Just like the Pharisees weren't so nice with Jesus, one day was questioning on what authority he was doing these things. But Jesus, you know, responded with what? A question, you know, especially in Mark chapter 11. Uh, he asked them, answer me and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. And for those of you who know, uh, they couldn't really come up with a good answer. And so at the end he said, neither will I tell you by what authority. I do these things. So uh, each situation is different. And what I always like to do as far as questions go, I always, these are general questions that you can ask anybody about anything. What do you believe and why do you believe it? Okay. You can ask in any situation, what do you believe and why do you believe it? If you take nothing else away from this presentation, it's those two questions. What do you believe and why do you believe it? That way, they have to give you a reason why they believe what they believe. And like these guys mentioned, the Socratic method, it causes them to think, maybe, you know, about, okay, why do I really believe this? You know, it plants that that seed that you mentioned. Um, Again, it's it's all about that search for truth. Um, And if I can go on, Whenever someone gives you an assertion or a reason for why they believe what they believe, again, you want to listen to understand and not respond, okay? Because that, and you guys know, since you mentioned law school, you guys know that whenever you're questioning a witness at the stand or or whenever you're talking with one of your clients, right, you're asking probably several questions in a row to try to get at, particular piece of information that that you're looking for um, you know and and you guys have been trained doing that in law school uh, and so that way you're talking to someone instead of at someone and, and you're you're trying to find like I said that common ground that that you're trying to build a relationship with that person I think that person would be a lot more open to sharing with you if you establish that that relationship. If you do it, like I said, with gentleness and reverence, as St. Peter says. Um, Knowing that they're a person yeah. made in the image of God, mm. you know, and they are entitled, they have full, that full <laughs> dignity. Because a lot of times these situations are so charged mm. and yeah. controversy is, is, is lit and there's a, there's a, um, you know, kind of an adversarial atmosphere, going, mm. you know, or climate 
And uh, so it's really important to know that this is one of God's creatures, precious deer, mm -hmm. uh, made in his image, fearfully and wonderfully made. You know, so to kind of that, that, so that whole listening to understand, um, you're not ready to fire ammunition at them. You're ready to defend your position. You're giving, as St. Peter said, a ready defense, a defense mm -hmm. for the for the hope that's that's within you, because we're we're sharing. We are, as you said, we're sharing the gospel. Yeah. We have a joy for what we have. Otherwise, as Saint Paul says, we're of all men most pity, pitiable. Hmm. If this weren't the truth, so we know we have the truth, hmm. and that's so you can kind of rest easy in that. That's actually one thing that gets me like all fired up about the Catholic Church is yeah. I kind of I didn't have to. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I found that I didn't really have to fight as hard. Like yeah. there's so much of this has it's been true, thought yeah. through and, um, I don't know. I, I was able to rest a lot easier as a Catholic defending these positions because a, they made more sense. They were much more consistent. Um, and I think they also appealed and resonated with humanity in yeah. a much deeper and wider way than mm -hmm. in most other, than any other, uh, teaching, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And, and that being said, so once once you establish that relationship and, you know, the person you're talking to, you're arguing with, and they present why they believe what they believe, well, the truth's on your side, you know, like, like it is in the Catholic Church. Well, then you can start to poke holes, you know, in their reasoning, in their arguments. And I like to give, you know, I, I, I've started into pro-life apologetics a little bit, especially given the, um, the recent... Texas state law that was passed banning banning abortions if there's a heartbeat presence, a heartbeat law. Uh, if you want to talk to somebody about anything, you can simply ask them, what do you think about this? Or what do you think about that? So, like, what do you think about Catholicism? Or what do you think about Christianity? What do you think about God? And so, in this case, I could, I could ask someone, hey, if I, want, if I really want to have an in-depth discussion, it's like, okay, hey, what do you think about abortion? You know, um, and, and once they respond, I'll ask them, okay, why do you think that? So one example I like to give is, you know, if, if you ask them, what do you think about abortion? And they respond, well, I think abortion should be legal up to, you know, three months of pregnancy. And I ask them, okay, why do you think that? Uh, you know, because, it, I don't know, the, uh, I guess the fetus, you know, doesn't really look like a baby yet. Okay, all right, that's, it's, that's interesting. My challenge would be, okay, well, what would you say about disfigured people who don't look like humans? Do they have a right to life? I mean, are, is their intrinsic value any less because they don't look <clears throat> like a human? Is there, and in the same way, you can see that logic applies to the fetus that's in the mother's womb. And so you can, that's just one example. Whenever you also, whenever you hear someone make an argument, you also have to ask yourself this question. Do the premises in their argument support what their conclusion is, what their belief is? Does, does their reasoning work? So uh, you mentioned Socrates earlier. One, an example of a, a valid argument would be like a first premise all men are mortal. A second premise would be Socrates was a man. Conclusion, Socrates was mortal. And so you can see that it's very logical reasoning and it all kind of connects to one, one premise connects to the other premise connects to the conclusion. So it's kind of hard to argue with that. And so that's why I say listening is so important. Right, you wanna you wanna really think through what that person is telling you, um, and um, it's 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 just an example argument that I like to give. Uh, what you don't want to do, and what and what you have to notice when other, what other people do is what I call straw manning, you know, an opponent. <clears throat> when I say straw man, I think of like a scarecrow. Straw man or scarecrows, they're easy to put up and they're easy to take down. And what, what people tend to do is they will characterize or mischaracterize your position on something. You know, they'll mischaracterize like, okay, why do Catholics worship Mary, right? Well, we all know that that's, that's not what we believe. But 
they'll take maybe what they've heard from someone else and they'll mischaracterize our belief. And people will do that about all sorts of things, you know. Um, it, it's an easy knockdown, I guess, argument to have, but you have to you have to recognize when that happens and tell them, well, hold up, hold up, that's that's not what we believe, you know, or that's not what the church teaches, you know. Here's what we really believe, or, or, you can ask them a question. It's like, okay. Well, why do you believe that Catholics worship Mary? And then they might tell you something something interesting. They might say, "Well, I heard it from so and so," or "I." You or know, it looks like you do. It looks it like, looks we like do. you do. You have statues of yeah. her everywhere. Why do you have more? Mm. You have more statues of Mary than you have of Jesus. Right. Who that that, show, that tells me who y'all think is more important? Mm. You know. Then then you kind of then, then it kind of brings out a little bit more depth. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. um, and you have some stuff to work with. You have some stuff to work with, as opposed to just telling them, "Well, no, we don't. We don't. We don't worship Mary." Um, it, that way, you kind of get you have a deeper conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, like you said, and and the straw man fallacy occurs all the time. Like especially, we, yeah. like you mentioned social media. I don't argue on social <laughs> media. Like I have a policy of saying, just no. If someone wants to argue with me, <clears throat> we're doing it in person, or we're doing it one on one. Not to say not in a public forum, but we're doing it in a more personalized, you know, environment setting. Because on social media, people tend to forget that there is a person on the other end of that comment or on the other other end of that argument. And so what happens is people on social media, I feel like people just wanna get be right, be the right one. Mm. Right. People just wanna win. And most of the time it's people they just want to throw bombs like I was saying earlier you know and it's just just fighting for the sake of fighting without really putting a whole lot of thought into it and mm -hmm. now I think there's some value in <laughs> thought provocation some. provoking mm, yeah. thought mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you're guilty you're I'm just saying I'm guilty am, I'm just so. saying I'm guilty <laughs> I don't fight with people though I really yeah. don't and that's maybe that's some of what I'm guilty of is I throw it out there and I like run away <laughs> <laughs> no, if somebody really is earnest about wanting to get to the point, and that's the thing. In yeah. general, my policy has been like, I, like so because we we kind of reverted or converted to the Catholic mm -hmm. faith um, in sort of a like none of our family really is. I mean, our extended some of our extended extended family, my extended family is Catholic, but my wife's is not. So we kind of converted, and I, I was a deacon in a Presbyterian church, so we kind of left in a position that was, you know, all of our people were sort of against what we were doing, or a lot of our people were, and um, our community, I should say. And so it made for some, um, it, the potential for some friction. So my policy has never been that I would beat them up with my Catholic faith. If people had questions about it, feel free to ask me till, you know, till the cows come home. <clears throat> But now, if people get barbed and ugly about it, yeah. I'll, the, the the gloves come out. Mm -hmm. gloves, the gloves come off. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah. and I will jump in. Uh, but I mean, it took me years to get to some of these things. So mm -hmm. I I was yeah. slow, prayerful, and that's a, that's another thing. Like be very prayerful about all of this, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and just kind of methodical, patient, patient. I think mm -hmm. with both ourselves and with other people and with. Uh, with with the Lord and on the Lord, you know, wait mm -hmm. on the Lord to bring him to where you're you're going. Um, but I really think, you know, too, you know, we're given these 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 kind of pointers. I can't emphasize enough that you know if people are going to engage in apologetics to to know the material themselves, because yeah. there's so often where you know, you know it's helpful to at least. I wish I'd had somebody that could have told me the, the my errors, the, the stuff that I did not know about my faith um, at the time, you know, whenever I was challenged and left the faith over the Eucharist. Mm. Um, you know, I, I thought I knew what it, what the teaching was, and um, but it, it was so much more nuanced than that, and it went a lot deeper. And uh, so I, I, I wish I'd known my faith better. So mm -hmm. the challenge for anyone mm -hmm. to undertake apologetics is to, you know, have a just a deep appetite for mm -hmm. um, for the knowledge of the things of God and to study 
the, the church, study sacred scripture, sacred tradition, you know, and to know your stuff. Love you at that green book, the catechism. Mm. We don't have a catechism <clears throat> out here, Fernando. What um, is catechism? Well, I, I, I did, you know, I think I did. I do have it. I just didn't. Mine's you know, all torn mine's up, gonna, so nobody would want to see it anyway. Mine's going to be a, it's going to be a Leaning Tower Pisa over here. <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 right. right. Put, stack too many books. But you're right. I was, in fact, I'm glad you mentioned that because if you want to get into Catholic apologetics, like, you know, to the extent that you want to, uh, read the catechism. I mean, that's, that's nice. And I'm guilty of not doing that enough. <clears throat> uh, but the catechism's got the groundwork for you to, to get into. Um, I'm in, it's interesting you mentioned the Eucharist. I'm going to bring up a, another example. Uh, it's a mutual friend of ours, a brother in Christ, Catholic brother in Christ. He recently um, had a question that he posed, um, and I got into a conversation with him about it. He had a question that he posed as far as the Eucharist and why non-Catholics can receive it, specifically um, non-Catholic Christians like Protestants, for example. I bet I know who you're talking about. I, I think you do. Um, and I bring it up as an example. I think it's a good one. Um, so he asked, okay, hey, if the Eucharist has healing properties, right? The Eucharist heals us, sustains us, uh, gives us uh, charity and all that good stuff. He said, hey, why can't you know our Protestant brothers and sisters partake of the Eucharist since it has all these graces that it bestows upon us, um, that Jesus himself gives us? So he asked that question, and instead of, and he, we got into a conversation about it. It wasn't a long one, but I didn't tell him that, well, because I, I didn't respond to him with what the church teaches. I asked him a question. I said, okay, let's assume that, okay, we grant that uh, non-Catholic Christians can receive the Eucharist, okay? I asked him this question. I said, can atheists? Could atheists be able to receive the Eucharist? He responded, and I'm paraphrasing, he responded, well, they should be welcome. And that's about it. I asked him a follow-up question. He said, I agree they should be welcomed to participate in the Mass to the extent that they can. But that wasn't my question. My question was, should they be allowed to receive the Eucharist? And then his response to me was, well, don't you love our Protestant brothers and sisters? Do you see the straw man? Yeah, the straw man the there. Straw man, it makes right. it easy to say like, well, <laughs> uh -huh. I'm the villain because I don't love them. That's right. Right. And that's One not, does not imply actually, or deduce from the other. Right. right. And the rest of the story is that we do love them and that's why we don't let them come yet. And that sounds... That makes me feel yeah. like kind of shakes me to the core to say that because mm -hmm. I'm such an includer. I hate mm -hmm. excluding anybody yeah. from anything. Mm -hmm. um, but we do it out of love for them. Well, you know. and, and so you have to take it to the source of truth that mm -hmm. the parties would acknowledge. Mm -hmm. And even if an atheist doesn't believe in God at all, he would at least acknowledge or she that the Bible is the book that drives all of Christianity, you know, whether you're Catholic mm -hmm. or Protestant, you both look to the Bible as authority. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and so an atheist would respect that a Catholic would, would, you know, would look to the Bible as their source of authority and should respect mm -hmm. that that's the teaching. Mm -hmm. So the Bible, St. Paul in first Corinthians tells, um, tells the Corinthian church that they're eating and drinking in an unworthy manner and mm -hmm. they need to discern the body of mm -hmm. Christ. The discern meaning acknowledge and behold and know, <clears throat> and know what they're that the body in. of Christ is real and present in the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. And non Catholic our non Catholic Christian brothers and sisters have outright rejected that. And I'll just say, they may not now, but 500 years ago during the Protestant Reformation, there are documents that denomination after denomination after denomination expressly said, we reject mm -hmm. what the Catholic Church says on this matter. Mm -hmm. And so as long as you are a part of that, this is what my answer to that specific question is, mm -hmm. it's as long as you're, you're, you're a part of that group, you're saying that we reject, I, I reject what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And so we can't let you 
participate if you're going to not discern the body. It's for your own protection. Hmm. Uh, 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 in in the Bible, the Bible says that that we should not admit you to the table. As as broken as that may make us, like I I hate it. It hurts if I it hurts anytime I see anybody for any reason not because you want to share. You want to right. partake together with so, everyone. So you know? yeah. my 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 challenge is always. So can you maybe forget about 500 years ago? How about we now look at this and take it take a look with brand new eyes that aren't you know that you know let's forget that 500 years ago <coughs> um, Martin Luther and Henry VIII and John Calvin said that the Protest the Catholic teaching on this issue is to be rejected. Let's look at this through eyes and, and reason together. And that's the issue, reasoning together. And let's look at this and, yeah. and say like, hey, you know, let that open, let that, the Eucharist is a great place to go because it can then take you, you to take the Eucharist, you it's have to believe, summit. it's the yeah. source and summit of our Christian life. Yes, of course. Mm-hmm. It's also the, it's also, you have to believe all that the Catholic Church says and teaches. So, yeah. um, so if you can say like, well, yes, you can come and take it if you believe all that the Catholic Church says and teaches. What do you not believe that she says and teaches? What's troubling you? And let me help you walk through that. Yeah. You know, it opens up all those issues. And not, and I don't want to be adversarial about it, but it is uncomfortable. And I think we're not, as Pope Benedict said, we're not called to comfort. We're not made for comfort. We're made for greatness. Mm-hmm. So being uncomfortable is a, it's growth. It's like no pain, no gain. We're, I grow in that, in learning yeah. these things. So it's a beautiful thing to do with, uh, mm-hmm. with our non-Catholic Christian brothers and sisters. Yeah. Um, the other reason I use that example is because sometimes you want to entertain the other side's belief or the other side's reasoning, <clears throat> and you want to take it to see how far it goes. Because sometimes people don't think about why they believe what they believe, and they don't think about the implications of why mm-hmm. they believe. The consequences believe. of ideas. The consequences, mm-hmm. exactly. Because I would say there's not too much difference between an atheist who doesn't believe that the, the, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord is present in the sacrament. There's not much difference between an atheist that believes that and then a Protestant that rejects mm-hmm. that belief as well. Right. So that's why, and that's why I asked him that question. And that's why, I have a feeling that's why he declined to clearly answer it as well. Um, did you have something to add to that? Well, you know, just um, this, the, your hypothetical, um, why, it, from, a, from a non-Catholic, why do you not include non-Catholics in receiving the Eucharist? You know, there's a lot of interesting directions you can go in with, uh, with this technique of asking questions. And so, you know, my, my instinct would be to respond, you know, to the question of if, it's, if it provides all these graces, why don't you allow non-Catholics to do it? Well, my question would be, well, do you believe that it provides these graces? And he might answer no, and I'd say, well, why does it bother you then? Mm-hmm. And, or he might answer mm-hmm. yes, and I'd say, well, do you believe that it provides these graces because it's the body and the real body and blood of Christ as we believe? He might answer no, and I'd say, well, why do you believe it provides those graces? He may not have an answer for that. Or he may answer affirmatively, in which case I would simply respond, then why aren't you Catholic too? You know, there's a whole lot of, you know, it's, you know, you, there's a whole lot of directions you can go in with this and it really opens up the floor to all kinds of, you know, you know, the the pursuit of truth and the, you know, the winning of souls. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, I'll I'll touch on the scattershot technique that I, um, the scattershot technique that I mentioned earlier. A lot of times, like I mentioned earlier, there'll be, someone will fire a lot of questions or objections at you all at once, don't fall <laughs> for it, okay? Tell them you're more than willing to have a discussion with them or an argument with them, but tell them, okay, you have to pick one topic to discuss or one topic to argue. Or to argue. Because they'll try, to, they'll try to switch the subject on you. I've had that happen to me before. I'm just gonna bring it back to the original topic, to the original subject and say, hey, I'm happy to talk about this or that, maybe at another time, to have a good, deep discussion about it, deep, good, deep argument about it. But let's stick to what you originally had a question about. 
This is okay. where I can learn from you, Fernando, yeah. because <laughs> I am like, bring it. <laughs> <laughs> bring it all, right? Uh, but you're right. You don't. You're not able, you're to, not able to go and yeah. adequately address necessarily everything. And it, 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 at the end of the day, probably leaves that other person unsatisfied, mm-hmm. um, even though they may think. You know they're satisfied with the. They're not necessarily satisfied if they're wanting to change the subject. Mm-hmm. So and that's where that's an op, that's where there's opportunity to grow, mm-hmm. is to kind of yeah. go deeper and just say like we have not fully fully addressed this issue yet. Um, let's do it for the sake of of our building up and of our friendship of our acquaintance of of building brotherhood, brother and sisterhood and mm-hmm. uh, or and for the building ultimate building up of the body of Christ. Yeah. The other thing I'll mention is. You have to, you have to discern a little bit where that person's at, because sometimes someone will want to argue with you, but they're not going to be really open to what you have to say, even though they'll still have objections to what you believe, or they may have different reasons, you know, why they believe what they believe. Um, people have to be willing to dialogue with you, and same thing. I would say the same thing applies to me you know, to us, that we have to be willing to, you know, to go deep with them. Because if that, if that willingness is, if if they have a hardened heart, (coughs) a heart of stone, I guess you could say, there's not too much that you can do to, to change that. I mean, you could, you could try to open them up a little bit, but, you know, you have to, you have to, sometimes, sometimes people are not emotionally in, in a good state to want to discuss a particular aspect of, uh, of the faith, right. uh, of Christianity. Um, uh, sometimes that emotional state will um, will take some time to break down. I know? have areas of the, the faith that I'm, st- I'm like that about, mm. of, the, of church teaching. Mm. So I think we also, we can bring out that sort of empathy and sympathy yeah. uh, with uh, the person that we're dialoguing mm. with that we don't have it all figured out. Yeah. Even... God has not even shown us everything to have it figured out. He still says in Scripture that the secret things belong to him yeah. and uh, that ultimately all things are, are left to his mercy. Now, but the one thing that the Catholic Church has is that it's got an unbroken line of 2,000-plus years of pondering these things and of chewing on these <clears throat> things. And, and there's nothing new under the sun, as Ecclesiastes says in Sacred Scripture, that there's all... Um, all these things, everything's happened mm. that, that can really be a, a man's common experience. So, um, so there's basic principles that have been addressed year after year, after decade, after decade, after century, after century, after now millennium, after millennium, mm. uh, that the church has, has addressed. And so it's, it's really cool when I became Catholic or came back to the Catholic church, mm. you know, I found some areas that when I was a, I was a Protestant, the church I was a part of was kind of positing these things as new and look at what we found out and then I'll have found out that that St. Augustine said it you know 1500 four, 1600 yeah. years before <laughs> yeah. so it's like oh okay <laughs> it, what's, it's what happens when you yeah. break from history you know and you break that tie mm-hmm. they've there's there's 1500 years that's lost really yeah mm-hmm. so I mean there's some times that they're they'll they'll hearken back but it's it's not all the time one of my favorite uh, pro-life apologists is Stephanie Gray uh, Connors. It used to be Stephanie Gray. She was speaking at a. She was telling a story of how she was speaking at a uh, conference one time, and uh, she was she was I think in the Q and A portion of her uh, of her talk, and she was going back and forth uh, with one of the audience members about um, you know abortion shouldn't even be is not is not a morally right even in the case of rape, you know. And Which so, is severe. That's a hard. It's hard. Thing it's to a really fear. hard uh, emotional, you know, situation. And so she was going back and forth with this particular audience member, and for some reason she wasn't getting through to her. And she was thinking to herself, "Man, my arguments are airtight. They're like, they're just really logical. Why isn't this person listening?" And so what she ended up doing eventually was, uh, the Stephanie ended up uh, retelling a story about a friend of hers who had a. Uh, who had undergone a, you know, a rape situation, and that she suffered severe trauma, you know, as a result of uh, as a result of that. And she, Stephanie, was telling the audience that how she helped her friend in her recovery, 
from that, how she was kind of there present with her. Um, she also recounted that um, the women that get pre impregnated as a result of that rape, that having the abortion doesn't take away that emotional trauma. That does, it doesn't help. You know, it does nothing to alleviate it. When she got through telling that story, the audience member responded to her and said, yeah, 10 years and counting. Mm. And, mm. This, and the question that Stephanie asked her next was, how are you doing? How are you doing? You see, see how, see how that changed? It engages a on a human level mm, and yeah. not this <clears throat> theoretical level because yeah. it's real life. This is mm. real life. Everybody's everything, been through something. Everything you know? that we're and that and 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 who? I'll tell you this. One mm. of my favorite set, and this is what I, I recommend them all the time. I mean, people, the standard Catholic apologetics books, Rome, Sweet Home. You know, mm -hmm. uh, by Scott and Kimberly Hahn. Good book. Um, the Surprise by Truth series that Patrick Madrid uh, edits, but they're just collections of testimonies. It's stories. Mm -hmm. There's stories. The Everybody, stories. like, the, like the, the strongest, you can read doctrine, you can read the catechism. The catechism is extremely handy. I dog ear it and flat <coughs> put little stickers in it and, mm -hmm. you know, tabs and whatnot and, and, uh, and, and use it till it falls apart. But, the stories of pe real life testimonies. There's probably there. I don't know that there's anything else other than the Eucharist itself, that mm -hmm. is as pow the sacraments themselves that are as powerful of a sharpener of a of a of a <clears throat> truth, um, mm -hmm. truth giver uh, and delivery mechanism and vehicle. I mean, it's just like you can't beat somebody's relatable story. Every we all we, mm -hmm. from from our our yeah. smallest childhood, we loved being told a story. So, um, you know, if you can identify, and that's the thing is a lot of us, especially, you know, I'll say this, you know, James and I are converts. Converts can really relate yeah. to, you know, what, you know, that same struggle. Like I can, I can say like, look, I know I hated the Catholic church. I burned a Bible because it had a picture of Jesus in it. And I was anti pictures of Jesus and thought that there should be no representational art in Christianity. Mm -hmm. um, and that usually, yes, I, I teach confirmation. And when I tell like my first night teaching the kids, they're, they're, they're like, what <laughs> you did? What? <laughs> I mean, and I thought I was doing a good thing. I was destroying <laughs> image, destroying idols. <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, but, but it's, mm -hmm. I, it was, you know, we, every, as you said, everybody's got a story and all of us do all of us, whether you, you've never strayed a day from, you know, <sighs> Recently, mm -hmm. I had the opportunity to hear, um, to hear. I guess people are going to hear this. Uh, it's Deacon Scott Brandle, they're going to know him locally. Mm -hmm. uh, just hear him talk. Just hear him talk, and he will tell you he was a goody goody. Like he, you know, doesn't have this like, oh no, like this. This I turned away from you know years and years of drug abuse and addiction and abuse, uh, uh, you know, personal abuse by my family. He doesn't have a. His story is clean. It's so powerful, though. Everyone has a story. So if people yeah. beat themselves up for not thinking, the Lord, the, the power of the Holy Spirit activating and active and at work in the human soul mm -hmm. is the most breathtaking thing that we could ever behold. Mm -hmm. So, and to know yeah. and have received that relate. So at the end of the day, it's kind of like full circle, Fernando. Yeah. You talked about, you know, asking questions and making them feel hum like it's it's humanity it's it's really mm -hmm. just relating its relationship it's building relationship which is ultimately what our lord wants <clears throat> to do with us each, each situation is different okay because some situations like like what stephanie mentioned and what you just got done mentioning sometimes you can't appeal to the mind sometimes you have to appeal to the heart because that's where that's where the conversion is going to take place. Mm -hmm. Not just, it's not all logic and rationale and, you know, giving good reasons. Sometimes you have to go deeper. And also, it's why your, your policy of not arguing on social media, though, you know, who knows where the seeds can be planted, right? Yeah. But it's, faith is a gift. Mm -hmm. Faith is a gift. That's biblical. That's the catechism. I mean, that kind of blew me away because I was Calvinist. And, you know, like, oh, predestination, you know, God, it's God, yeah. only God operating on us completely. Yeah, yeah. We don't have any say in it no, at all. No cooperation. But, yeah. um, but 
the Catholic Church teaches that faith is a gift. The Holy Spirit has to activate it in our hearts first for us to even really be soft soil to receive it. Yeah. So, you know, know that also what you're doing is you're sowing seeds and praying that they're fertile soil and that the Lord, by his Holy Spirit, would activate his good, deliver that gift of faith to that person. Mm. Yeah. And so like you mentioned earlier, um, you have to be knowledgeable about your faith, about the Catholic faith. Um, that means going through the catechism, if you have a question about something, you know, if you ever, if it ever pops into your head, um, have a good understanding of why you believe what you believe, you know, especially with the top objections, the common objections that um, you guys would know better than I do. Uh, it's always good to share a, a little testimony, you know, about, <clears throat> you know, how you either converted or, you know, why you stay Catholic. Mm -hmm. It's always nice to, to share that with somebody because someone can identify with you Pre on pretty much on any level. Someone can identify with that on any level um, from any type of background. And, you know, I, I like to have, uh, you know, if, if someone is questioning the existence of God, because I'm sure maybe those of you who are watching, some of you probably know somebody who's agnostic, who's atheist, who's skeptical about the existence of God and, you know, I, I always like, again, to ask them the question, well, what do you think about, what do you think about God, you know, and what are your reasons for not believing in him or why do you, why don't you think God exists? And it's always nice to have, um, it's always, I always like to have some arguments kind of in the back of my head just to kind of have a good foundation or groundwork to, depending on what that person responds, right? Depending on how they respond and what reasons they give. Um, just like the moral argument, the contingency argument are some of my favorites in particular. Um, but that's mainly for, you know, people who don't, who don't re really believe in the existence of God, but it's just what all about... What are those, by the way? <coughs> the, the moral mor argument and the contingency argument. So if, if objective moral values exist... Well, then God exists. Goodness. If, like, in other words, thou shalt not kill. If killing is wrong. Yeah. If murder, you know, if, if murder, murder is wrong. wrong. If theft is wrong. Mm -hmm. wrong Especially wrong, of wrong. innocent, innocent human beings, right? Right. And we're kind of getting to the pro-life, you know, right. argumentation there. So if, if objective moral values, that's an example. If objective moral values exist, well, then God exists. If objective moral values do exist, therefore, God exists. See the premises, the one, the two, and then the conclusion. So that's one example that, that, that um, I kind of have in the back of my head. Okay, so now that person has to respond and maybe challenge you know, those premises or challenge what I've said. So now we've got an argument going. Now we've got a good discussion going. We've got a firm foundation. Um, so someone may say, well, objective moral values don't exist, you know. And so, right in some places, killing someone is good. I mean, what yeah. like there was child sacrifice in those in some old um, mm -hmm. uh, the Aztec um, <clears throat> civilization. They mm -hmm. had child engaged in child sacrifice. The Carthaginians, right? Um, they did. I mean, and that was considered a good thing to appease gods. What do we? What if if they say it was good? How do we know that it's not? Mm. Mm. Right. So then you can bring up the. Where do moral values, moral objective values come from? You know, are they based off of civilizations or, or humans? Well, then you can argue, well, no, they're subjective, right? Everyone's got a different idea of what, you know, where moral values, objective moral values come from. Because, you know, most civilizations will agree that cowardice is not a good value to have. Or that, you know, the, uh, you know, rape is not uh, a, a, is not moral, right? Is immoral, and so you can. The question is, just because certain people, certain groups of people, believe that this was good, was moral, it doesn't necessarily imply that it is objectively moral, you know, objectively good. And so you see how that conversation kind of starts, you know, if you have that framework in the back of your mind. Um, and so I, I would just say. For those of you who are watching, just kind of have, you know, have the personal testimony, have the personal story, but then, you know, have the rational arguments kind of in the back of your mind, just in case, depending on the situation. <coughs> um, the other thing I'll mention is, uh, so you're going to, you're going to get into uh, a discussion, an argument, and eventually 
someone's going to ask you a question that you don't know the answer to. Be humble and say you don't know the answer to it. Hey, that's a question I've never really considered. Can I get back to you on that? I'd like to look more into that. Or I, I need to do a little bit more research because that's an interesting objection that you raise. Maybe it's just as simple as looking it up in the catechism as far mm -hmm. as what, why you believe what you believe, why the, why the church teaches what it teaches. And I think this is so important because yeah. the, one, of the, one of the biggest things you have to do is you have to guard your credibility mm -hmm. in, in this. Mm -hmm. Your credibility is really all you have. And mm. the, one of the easiest ways you can lose credibility is if you don't know something, BSing your way, and then it turns out it's fairly mm. obvious you don't know what you're talking about. And so it's better to just be humble, as Fernando said. If you don't know something, just say, you know what? That's something I'm not that familiar with, but I'll get back with you about it. Right, you know? we're all about the truth here and bringing out the truth. So to interpose <laughs> something we don't know right. is true. <laughs> like because, hey, said. Because know. hey, uh, we know the truth mm -hmm. is gonna, the truth sets you free. The truth is what we're trying to get at. So we don't, um, we don't put falsehood into any of this. Um, mm -hmm. and, yeah. and not that we would want to, but the vulnerability there is pride. You know, our own pride, and That's as right. James said, your credibility, and it could just kill your credibility and, and, and you know, potentially even lose a soul. Mm -hmm. So this is important mm -hmm. stuff, mm -hmm. and so we don't, we, we treat it very, very carefully and humbly yeah. um, because this is, you know, this is our exalted Lord. Mm. I'm glad you mentioned that. That's a good little segue. Into yeah, because the, the apologetics in that area, there's there's yeah. kind of like a yeah you know, coming like as as I said yeah. earlier, bring it at <laughs> me, you know, <laughs> come at me, come at me, bro. You know, uh, yeah, I'm really glad you mentioned that. Um, as far as lo you mentioned losing the soul, uh, always just always remember, keep in the back of your mind that you're you're arguing, you're contesting an idea, like you're arguing against an idea. You're not. You're attack. You're challenging an idea. You're not. You're not um, attacking a person, right? You're not objecting against the person that you're speaking with. Um, the goal of an argument, the goal of the discussion of a debate, it's not. It's not really to win it, right? It it is to bring others to the truth. The goal of an apologist is to bring others to Jesus mm -hmm. Christ. Amen. Um, in it to win it doesn't exist, right? It, that's, that shouldn't be the focus. That shouldn't be the goal. Um, it's fun to win, especially when we're talking about sports, but this is different. It, it doesn't apply, apply here. Um, it's about winning souls, right? That's what proclaiming the truth, proclaiming the gospel is all about. Because if you, if you, if you, if you lose, you may win an argument, but if you lose a soul, then the <coughs> devil wins. And you, in that case, it's always a total loss for us, you know, as Catholics, as Christians. Uh, again, you have to be gentle and reverent too. If let's say that, let's say that the other side, the other person, doesn't know what they're talking about, or that they don't have good ideas. Or, or good reasons for why they believe what you believe. If you're, cl if you clearly have better reasons, you know, if you clearly have a, a better foundation for why you believe what you believe, well, don't pummel them into the ground. You know, um, be gracious, be gentle and reverent, and you know, acknowledge the other person and just say, hey, we'll agree to disagree. You know, but you don't have to, you don't have to make that person feel like. A loser essentially because again that kind of goes to not losing the soul of that person if anything <clears> throughout <throat> the entire exercise they are the treasure mm. that person is the treasure they yeah. are they are um, a soul beloved of God and you just out of love out of pure love you don't want to prove mm. that the Catholic Church is right the Catholic Church yeah. is right and doesn't need doesn't really need our defense mm. yeah. um, it, it, she defends herself, and Jesus said the gates of hell would not prevail against her. So right. we are really trying to point people to Jesus, as you said, Fernando. Um, so the, mm. the you know, just the law, the law of love, <coughs> love that, and, and and whatever you can do to have that come out, 
and yeah. have that as crystal clear as you can. Mm -hmm. um, it takes a lot of humility. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, they're there to see that person who may be, you know, challenging you and being an adverse, acting adversarially towards yeah. you. They mm -hmm. are your, tr they are the treasure. Mm -hmm. They're yeah. the precious pearl there. People may not always remember what you say, but they will remember how you made them feel. And it's not a boxing match. You're not fighting toe to toe with someone. You're, you're turning your shoulder and you're walking with that person to the truth. Um, and that's, I think that'd be, that's pretty much what I would say on that. Yeah, and you know, just to kind of just build on that, you know, we're not talking, this isn't about scoring points. This isn't, you know, in, in a normal intellectual argument, you know, you try to score your points, you try to get your shots in. This isn't that, this isn't the case. You know, we're talking, the what's at stake is hearts and minds, and that's the highest possible stakes. We're talking about souls. And so, you know, it's not a debate on the merits of Texas A&M football versus LSU football like you might see on Facebook. Go or, Tigers! Or why the Democrats are I don't have a dog in this fight. Who knows? You know, any, anything. This is a completely different ball game. It's, it's hearts and minds and it's souls, and the stakes are the highest possible. Mm -hmm. So that gotcha moment is so tempting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, yes, it is. But... Mm. It's not what we are about. Mm. Um, you know, it, it really isn't. And it's so tempting. I've been in it, and I've done them. I've done the gotcha, mo like, you know, the ha-ha-ha, mm. yeah. like, this is why. And it's <clears throat> and a lot of it's from old old dear brothers in Christ that, you know, objected to where I go went. So they're yeah. kind of attacking that position. Mm. And so um, so the, def the defensiveness was already kind of ratcheted up. Um, but you know, I, I think I can say, and I, I'm trying to remember back, like through the last, you know, decade plus, you know, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 years since we've been kind of doing this, um, and since my journey back to Rome, Romeward, Romeward, <coughs> homeward began. Rome, sweet Rome. Right. It, um, I don't know that I've gotten, I don't know that I've really gotten to where I did irreparable harm to any of my, mm. um, my yeah. Protestant brothers and sisters or atheists. But in fact, yeah. one of my dearest friends in the world is an agnostic and he's very yeah. fascinated with, with my yeah. faith and that, you know, one that, and that's actually, that's kind of a point, you know, he's not, he does not, he's not a Christian uh, or not at least an open one, but he, um, you know, one thing that's probably the your biggest argument is that you live faithfully that you live yeah. faithfully in accordance with the teachings mm -hmm. of the church. You know, I, my <laughs> wife asked him, Rick, why, why are you so fascinated by, like, the way we practice our faith? He came to my confirmation and brought me a St. Joseph's statue oh, wow. uh, as a gift. And, uh, and he said, like, because I've never known anyone that actually sacrificed their own interests and desires and wants for what they believe, like that actually wanted to, li like it's, you know, usually people pick and choose and say like, oh, well, yeah. you know, but I'm going to have, I'm going to use birth control. You know, that's mm -hmm. the one thing I don't, you know, but it's people live, living faithfully yeah. is magnetic. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And I, I, I completely agree with that. And, you know, it's interesting, you know, I've, I've had a hand in bringing quite a few people into the church since I converted uh, back about nine years ago. And but I've never actively gone out and you know evangelized and tried to pull people in. It's always been they've just been watching me and they saw good things happening in my life. They wanted to know more about that or they wanted a part of that. Praise yeah. God. You know? Praise wow. the Lord. Yeah. Powerful. Mm. Anything else? Go Jesus. <laughs> praise praise the Lord. Praise, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Well, guys, thank you so much for uh, for tuning in for uh, for listening. We really appreciate your uh, your tuning in and um, and for your support as well. We'd ask that you uh, would further support us by um, liking us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, subscribing, following, whatever you need to do, so that that way these uh, Google and these other secular organizations will be forced to let you know whenever we post something new whenever we post new content on our Theology on Tap um, uh, pages and, you know, channels. And so, again, 
thank you. And uh, until next time, uh, stay thirsty and God bless. God bless.